Y'all can sit down. Good morning, Victory Baptist Church. Good morning. And good morning to all our visitors, and, and welcome to everybody that's watching us online right now. God bless America. Amen. You know, he has blessed us. We have freedoms that we enjoy in this country that are unknown all over the world. We can gather today in, in the bright light of the sun and come here and worship God as we see fit as we see fit, and I'm glad to see that y'all see it fit today. You know, I didn't used to think of Memorial Day as anything but another holiday, the beginning of summer, a chance to go out, get on the water, go fishing or something like that. And then about 20 years ago, I was working out in Cross at the power plant. They have a little veterans memorial right outside of St. Stephen's. And I saw a guy stop in front of me, and I see if I get through this, and he got out with a, a bouquet of flowers, and he went in front of that memorial and he knelt down and he started praying. And it hit me. Freedom is not free. Freedom is not free. We have the freedom of speech. We have the freedom of travel. We have the right to a free press. We can vote for whoever we want to, whether you agree with it or not. Every one of these freedoms, men and women have been dying for over 250 years for these freedoms. And I'd like to take just a minute and, and read a piece of scripture. And this is out of John 15, verses 12 and 13. And Jesus said, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. And that's what these men and women have been doing. They took that to heart. And they laid down their life for us so that we can be here today. They may not have known us, but they died for us and for our freedoms. Amen. God bless them all. God bless them all. Does anybody have any unspoken requests? Well, many hands are raised. Let's, let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, you know all the hands that were raised and what they represent. And Father, we ask that you reach out your healing hand and you touch those, that you answer those prayers, that your will be done here on this earth, Father. And Father, we thank you so much for the blessings that you've given us, this country, the greatest country on the face of the earth. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit coming down upon these soldiers and giving them the boldness and the courage to fight for our freedoms. Father, we pray for the families, the gold star families that have lost loved ones. Father, we pray for those that have had family members died in the service of our country. And Father, we ask that you reach down and touch those families and relieve them of their griefs, that they may know the peace that comes from knowing you. And Father, as we come through the following week, let's reach out to others so that they too may know the peace that comes from knowing Jesus. And all we do, Lord, we do in your name, in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Victory Baptist Church. Amen. Give the Lord a shout or a hand clap. Amen. Amen. Uh, praise God. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out to worship the Lord Jesus today. And uh, thank you, Brother Craig. Uh, that was beautiful. And we're here because of someone else laying their life down. Amen. And uh, so um, please keep all those families out there in your prayer. Uh, this can be a hard weekend for a lot of families. Uh, I, I do want to just uh, give a few announcements. One, we will be having service tonight if you'd like to come back and join us at 7 p.m. Uh, also, next Sunday is Graduation Sunday. And so we're going to celebrate anyone who's uh, uh, graduating K-5, high school, or college. We want to celebrate you. And so please contact us so we can get your name and our bulletin and, and just celebrate with the family. And so uh, you can email us or give us a call and we'll get them down. Uh, that night, we'll be having a spiritual gift night. Uh, if, if you're interested in that, we do have a uh, spiritual gift uh, assessment. That's just a brief test uh, the, to... Um, and it's biblical based. It's right out of uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 when it talks about spiritual gifts. And some of you might have never taken one of these before, especially if you're new to faith. And this by no means is going to tell you, yep, that's, that's what it is. What I've discovered, the easiest way to figure out what your spiritual gifts are is to step out and serve. You will quick, quickly know whether or not you should be in children's ministry. Amen. 
You, you, amen. And, and so uh, that, that's what I'd say. But Sunday night, we're going to start here in the sanctuary and have some time of worship and then go over to the social hall. And we'll have ice cream that night. And so uh, I'll, I'll tell you, if you want to bring your favorite uh, scoop, that, that'd be good. You know, uh, but we'll have uh, things that you can uh, dress your ice cream with. And that, that'll just be a good uh, night of service and uh, worshiping the Lord Jesus. I also have just a few uh, really important things I wanted to run by everyone. Uh, one, most of you have been praying for a Mr. Thomas Bodiford. He's a young man. He was in that boating accident uh, nearly three, almost four weeks ago. Uh, he walked a little bit this week. So that's uh, some really cool. It's very good. He's, uh, he's been in the wheelchair, and now they've moved him to the walker, and so this is just uh, phenomenal. He's healing very good. He got his stitches out Friday, and, and the, the doctor said he is healing very well. So keep him in your prayer. I know many of y'all have been lifting up our sister, Kathy Graham. Uh, she suffered uh, a, a ruptured uh, brain aneurysm uh, this Tuesday morning. Now, she was here at the church when that happened. And uh, she could have been alone, so God made provision. And, uh, and so uh, this morning she's doing very well. Uh, she's still healing. We're, we're hoping to get to that Friday or Saturday mark next week, and, and we'll really be able to determine uh, how, how well she's healed. And, but she's able to get up and move around and talk, and she has no uh, permanent damage. And so that's just uh, praise God for that. Uh, it is. It's just uh, good, 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 good news. And uh, I know most of you are aware that we'll be collecting a love offering after the service. We'll have some men in each door with uh, one of our offering bags. And if you'd like to give to this family, uh, Cindy Lofton, uh, she's been a, a part of our family here for over 20 years. Uh, early 2019, she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, which you know that is an extremely hard cancer to beat. But uh, the tumor formed in just a perfect location, if we could ever say that, to where the doctors called it really early. And uh, the, the Lord and through the doctors spared her. And uh, earlier this year, she found out she has a mass on her kidney. And so um, uh, they, they actually had to send uh, this, her case to a, a cancer board uh, because of a money situation. So we wanted to do our part and help this family out. Uh, she had to go in for a biopsy on this kidney, which is very um, evasive. And she would have had to lay on her back for six hours after they took the sample. And uh, before they did it, they did another scan. And the tumor has shrank half. Uh, it's like, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, that's, um, so just uh, surrounded by miracles this week. It's a little overwhelming. Just a little overwhelming. Because I know that some of y'all are praying for miracles. And I would just say, keep praying for them. Don't, don't give up. Amen. So we're going to take that love offering up uh, after. And we have a, a ministry here called the Family Assistance Ministry. And they help families out who are in need. And they've agreed to match whatever we collect this morning. And so uh, praise God for that. But God is so good. And uh, if, if you woke up this morning and you didn't know what to be thankful for, just come and see me after service, all right? <laughs> me and the deacons are going to have a meeting with you. Amen. And uh We'll, we'll lay hands on you with prayer. Amen. <laughs> uh, but if you could, uh, could I have all the kids come down for the children's sermon at this time? I wish everybody ran the church. Amen. Uh, and praise God. Um, well, it's so good to see you all. I, I'm so sorry you're surrounded by boys today. I, I, I'm very, usually it's, it's the other way around. Amen. But you've got, there's a lot of you guys here today, which is really cool. And I hope you all have a beautiful Memorial Day weekend. I want to tell you a little bit about my granddad. His name was Silas Piegler Sr. And he served in the Army. And he fought in World War II. Amen. He had to go to Europe. And he drove an artillery truck. He was a part of a, a, a group called the Black Cats. And what his job was is to bring the ammunition to the soldiers through 
whatever they had to go through, whether it was war or whether it was bad roads or whether it was just bad weather, they had to get the ammo to uh, the place where it needed to go. Uh, and my grandfather saw a lot of things, and he really didn't talk about much of it. But there was two stories he told me that I've always uh, held on to. Is one time he was taking some ammunition to, like, it was like a little trench they call like a foxhole. And when he got there, he got the ammunition to the fella, and then he turned around, and right when he got out of that foxhole, a blast hit. And every one of those guys were gone. You know, that, that'll stick with you. Amen. And then he was in uh, England somewhere, and he drove, and they parked by a little tavern, and they were all resting. But when he got out of his truck, something told him to move the truck. And at first he wasn't going to move it, but then something told him again, I need to move this truck. And so he got in his artillery truck with all that ammunition and all that gunpowder, and he drove it and parked it into a different block. And right where that truck was, a blast hit. And the damage would have been uh, horrible. And that, so I want to ask you all, who do you think told my granddad to move that truck? God. Amen. God. It doesn't take uh, us too much to figure out amen, because you all know, sometimes God just speaks. And we need to listen. Amen. And so I just wanted to share that story with you guys, because I want to tell you that I serve a living God. He still speaks. And he still leads us and guides us. Sometimes we just need to be still a little bit so we can hear him. Amen. But I love you all so much. Now, how many of you all still say the Pledge of Allegiance? Uh, you all y'all, y'all say the Pledge of Allegiance? Well, I feel like it'd be really good for us. Do you all like my flag? It's all patriotic and stuff, right? Um, we're going to say the Pledge of Allegiance together. Is, is that all right? Would, would one of you all like to lead us in saying it? <laughs> uh, and, and if y'all want to try, can we all just like maybe do it together then? Is, is that all right? All right, well, let's, y'all want to stand by me as we face the flag? Is, can y'all stand with me too? Amen. All right, y'all ready? All right, let's put our hand on our heart. Y'all ready? Let's face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Thank you, kids, so much. Would you pray with me one more time? Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the country that you have allowed us to be born in, raised in, and, Father, for the religious freedom that we have. God, while we still have it, Lord, let us light this world up for you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, all God's people say. Amen. Thank you, kids, so much.
you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to come into your house to worship you in this way. Father, we thank you that we can give back to you, Lord. Father, let us not just lift up our hands, but Lord, let us lift you our hearts, Father. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen.
uh, please take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12. And we are going to start at verse 9. The Gospel of Matthew. Matthew, chapter 12, verse 9. Matthew chapter 9, All right, excuse me, Matthew chapter 12, <laughs> everybody's like, whoa, wait up, <laughs> Matthew chapter 12, verse 9, and we are going to read to verse 23. One time a preacher asked his congregation to turn to Mark 24, and you should have saw them looking for that chapter, you know, uh, <laughs> Mark's only got 16, you know, but um. Matthew chapter 12, verse 9, and we're going to read the verse 23. When you get there, say, okay. All right, most of y'all are there. And this is what took place in the life and time of Jesus and the apostles. Now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue, and behold, there was a man who had a withered hand, and they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? How much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. He healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make him known, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out. Nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. Then one was brought to him who was demon possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and the mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be? the son of David. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for this moment that we can worship you with the word of God. Father, I pray that you'd move my flesh out of the way that the very spirit of Jesus would minister to every heart and mind here. God, that you would do the healing as we provide the faith to you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like to just ask you, have you figured out your theme I don't know if you've maybe paid attention, but throughout your entire life, themes just kind of pop up in your life. Like just things that, like words or, or stories or moments, they just continually pop up in your life. And so I would just like to ask what your theme is. I think one of, one of my themes is persistence. I don't know if any of y'all have seen me, but I'm not much of a, I'm a little fella, you know. Uh, God shaped me and formed me, uh, not, I'm not very tall, amen, it's put, so it's put a big perspective in my life, the way he formed me and, and fashioned me, because I don't know, some of you tall people don't understand the uh, burden it is to bear, to be so short, uh, I think some of y'all take it for granted, but there's things that I have learned by being uh, a little bit uh, short in stature, is uh, one, make friends with big people, amen, that's just... Uh, <laughs> I think that's a, like a no-brainer right there, amen. And God sent me some really big friends in high school and in school in general. He, he really, God had my back in that respect. And I've never had a habit of looking down on people. Well, because I couldn't, you know. Uh, but, it, but it also put inside of me this idea of, of humbleness, to not look down on anybody. Uh, and, and I did have advantage on a lot of people, though. I see right up your nose most of the time, you know, I, I do, you know. <laughs> So you better make friends with me so I can help you out, amen? Because we all got things, amen, that we need someone to help us out with. Uh, it, it also, um, you know, put inside of me this understanding that it really doesn't matter what we are on the outside. 
it doesn't matter. Jesus Christ loves us how he has made us and how whatever burden you feel that you have, he still accepts you and loves you. And he's put that love inside of us so that we could love one another as he has loved us. And so one of, one of my themes, I feel, is just persistence. Because uh, I don't know if y'all know this, but uh, I was tall for a brief moment in my life. My second time in first grade, I towered all the other kids. It was just, you know, it's one of those things. Because I was not, what I would say, the sharpest tool in the shed. Amen? And I, I really, it came from a just uh, a great dislike of reading a great dislike of learning, a great dislike of school. I just couldn't stand the place. I didn't want to be there. And every moment I spent there, it felt like uh, forever, an eternity. And so when I was done with school, I was done with school. Listen, I was one of those kids that my parents had to push me all the way through school. Any of you parents feeling me? Amen. You know, you know, I had that one kid who just like, you just kind of drag him through school at times. I was that kid. And it's just funny how God works because I read a lot now, like a lot, and uh, God blessed me with even getting a, a master's of divinity. You know, someone who uh, was not much, who hated to read, who just, uh, but any time life ever knocked me down, I just keep on getting up. Persistence. You know, God still can use anybody. Amen? He still can. But he's not looking for another Moses. He doesn't need another David. He doesn't need another Joshua. He needs a you. You can give the Lord so much. And you can make the difference in so, in so many lives. Because no one is like you are. No one knows the people that, that you do in the way that you know them. God can really do a work. See, there's a great theme within the Bible. And that theme is light. It begins with it. Before God showed up on the scene, it was dark, chaotic, and it had no form. And God said, let there be what? Light. And there was light. So the very get-go, God really sets the tone for the theme of the Bible. One of those themes is light. And it's phenomenal because we have this great promise in Revelation that at the end of the Bible, it says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 5, it says, and there will be no more night. They need no light of lamp or sun, for God will be their light, and they will reign forever with him. That's a very precious promise to me. We, we see a theme from the beginning to the end that there's light. And right in the middle of it, uh, there's this guy named Isaiah. He gives this prophecy in chapter 9, verse 2, that uh, in the Galilees of nation, beyond the Jordan, a light has shined. People who walked in darkness will now see this light. Now listen, the prophet Isaiah, he prophesied this 600 years before Jesus was ever born. Matter of fact, he was also the prophet that said he would be born of a young virgin. Interesting. 600 years before the birth of Jesus. And here Jesus, he is preaching in this area of Galilee, Capernaum. Very interesting prophecy just being fulfilled and Jesus had this one thing to say in John 8 12 he said I am the light of the world he who walks in me shall not walk in darkness but will have the light of life I, I sense a theme in the Bible amen and I think that theme is light I think Jesus actually looked at a sea of people that he'd already healed fed and preached to and he said to them you are the light of what the world, salt of the earth. We sense a theme that Christ Jesus put inside of us and around us, light. I mean, how many of you ever walked into a dark room and flipped that switch on? Amen. Because it's not fun in the dark. Amen. How many of you were that kid? I needed that nightlight. Any of you? Some of you are adults now and you still need that nightlight. Amen. Uh, things in the dark. It's not fun. Sometimes our eyes will actually, what, adjust to the darkness around us. I think that's really amazing how our eyes are fixed and shaped and how God works with us even, then, even though we can't see properly. He's given us eyes that will actually adjust to the darkness around us. And as Jesus has called us to be light, we must consider this. What if our eyes have become adjusted to the darkness around us and we're not being the light that he's called us to be? We've just grown accustomed and adjusted to the darkness around us. 
I mean, how many of you have put up Christmas lights or Christmas, any, any Christmas lights on a tree or your house? Isn't that fun? How many of you just love hanging Christmas lights? Listen, there's a reason why I don't do that. Amen? I would be that one guy who would, I'd hang one string right in front of my front door. I was like, I did it. You know? <laughs> and how many of you ladies would be cool if your husband did that? Amen? He's just like, oh, I did it. Because you're going to want him to do what? Finish the job, man. Finish it up. Put the thing on the whole thing. So I don't think many of us would be all right if we just hung one light on a Christmas tree. But what, what do you think that uh, the church expects one person to shine? What if we all shone? What if we all just were bright? Think how many of you are driving down the road and your headlights just go out? I, I experienced that twice in my life where my headlights just went off. And, and you all know I have trouble driving with headlights on. I, mean, I, I just do. I, I'm, I'm a grace. God has given me grace when I'm in the vehicle. And so as I was coming down the road, I was almost home and my headlights just went out. And I know in that moment, if my wife was in the car, she would have said, stop the car, baby. And I would have responded, we got lights on the inside. The lights on the inside would not be good enough, amen. But I was so close to home, my eyes adjusted, and I could see the white line and the yellow line, and I saw our driveway, so I just eased right on in there. But I think some of us are driving around without headlights. Because Jesus is the light. And you can't be the light if you don't have the light. Amen? You, you can't do that. So I'd just like to ask you, how's your light shining? There's all types of different lights you can buy now. Have you ever seen a strobe light? Amen? You'll know when you've seen it because you'll be disoriented, right? And if you've ever seen a light bulb that's uh, dimly lit or is just fading or flashing on and off, Sometimes it's either the power supply or it could be a bad connection, right? But I just want to let you know, our power supply, nothing's ever wrong with him. It's normally our connection with him. And if we're not connected to the power source, we're not going to be able to be as light and as bright as he's called us to be. We have a theme throughout the Bible, and he has called us to be light witnesses in the world, amen? Amen. And I love this passage of scripture because Jesus has put in a scenario. I say he's put in a scenario because the, the lawmakers and the Pharisees thought that they were going to put Jesus in a scenario in which they could condemn him or uh, have something to say against him. And I love how Jesus shines in this moment. Well, if you look, let's look back at this passage of scripture. And it, it says this in verse 9 that when he departed from there, he came into what? A synagogue. And behold, there was a man with what kind of a hand? A shriveled or withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on what day? The Sabbath day. That they might do what? Accuse him. So I, I just think this is a really neat setup. It's in a synagogue. The actual word synagogue means congregation. That's what that word means. A synagogue was an extension of the Jewish temple. As all the Jews, they would go and they worship at the temple in Jerusalem. When they were dispersed and put in exile, some of them actually made their own synagogues or congregations. And to establish a congregation, you had at least have 10 to 12 men in their family. And so if you do the math, that works out to anywhere from 50 to 120 people, which is, I think is pretty phenomenal. Because that's kind of how our congregational system is. If you know what that word congregational that means this is a congregational church. We gather here in this moment. Most congregations are only about a, a 50 to 120 people because only about one person can take care of about 120 people. If you look at our country, most congregations are, are dying uh, or have plateaued or are coming to an end because one person can't take care of more than 120 people. Amen? Amen. You see where I'm going with this? Because Jesus has called every one of us in ministry. Because one person can't be in everyone's life at the same time. But I have a Savior who can. He said that I will be your teacher. He said that I will be with you. Amen? And so if we would come together and love one another, 
and take care of one another. God's body will be healthy. It will shine brighter because we just don't have one or two lights shining. We can all light up. Amen. Now, that's a very pretty Christmas tree when all the lights are shining. Amen. When all the lights are going. Amen. It's very beautiful. And so what congregations would do, even in that time, they'd put all the responsibility on one person. We learned this last week when we talked about this guy named Sosthenes who was beat by his congregation because the church was dying. And, uh, uh, I th well, uh, people, I think we still do that. <laughs> you know, we might not beat them in public, but we certainly are not kind to some spiritual leaders. Amen. And uh, I, I by no means is saying that every spiritual leader is innocent or amen. But what I am saying is that we all need to shine like Jesus. Amen. And so here's this congregation. And they all should love one another. But we have Jesus. He stepped into worship with them. And all of a sudden this guy with the withered hand is there. No. They knew this guy. They're in a community together. They brought this fellow and put him up front so Jesus could see him. I wonder how often they invited him to church before Jesus got there. I often wonder how many times they were actually courteous to him, actually put him up front. Or they would take this guy with a withered hand and is like, can you sit back there? You're, you're disgusting some of our congregants. Do you think people still get hit with that sometimes? So Jesus, he sees this man one, because he's Jesus, but two, they wanted them to see him because they had bad intentions within them. And they, it's like, Jesus, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And you know what Jesus did? He threw the law back at them. He threw at them Deuteronomy. And I, I love what, what Deuteronomy says in uh, chapter 22, verse 4. It says, you may not withhold doing help to your neighbor. He says, if you have a sheep or an ox and you see your neighbor's uh, stuff walking away, it's your responsibility to help your neighbor. And he said, how much more worth is a person to a sheep? Amen. How much more worth? Uh, these individuals did not care for this man with a withered hand. They cared more to justify themselves. And so in this moment, Jesus, he said that beautiful phrase, Stretch out your hand. And he made it whole. I want to tell you that Jesus is still the Savior and the God who says stretch out your hand. Because all of us here, we have some crooked roads and some crooked things and some things that have hindered us and withered us inside. And Jesus is still the Savior who says stretch out your hand. I will make it whole. And the one place that this man should feel comfortable in is within his congregation and synagogue. But what if that was the one moment that they actually ever paid attention to this guy's actual need? And in that one moment of bad intention, Jesus brought healing and deliverance and real, true acceptance. He says, stretch out your hands still to this day. It says in Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire knowledge of God or intimacy with God more than burnt offerings. That was God's intention from the beginning. When he walked with Adam in the light before Adam sinned and walked in darkness, God's intention always for mankind is to have a relationship with us that we might walk in his light, but we have a tendency to the dark. Matter of fact, that's what John wrote. He said, uh, and this is the crisis, this is the judgment of the world, that men love darkness rather than light so that our deeds can be hidden. Jesus has come to shine the light on us and set free our hearts and set free our lives in him. And uh, I, I'm also reminded in this moment, because these lawmakers, Jesus brought up Deuteronomy chapter 22 about helping your neighbor. But these lawmakers actually made laws on top of God's word just in case they would have to actually help a neighbor. Amen. They, they made laws on top of that so they wouldn't have to. And Jesus was showing them the, uh, what I would say, the hypocrisy of the laws that they created. And we kind of do that today ourselves. Amen. We, we kind of make rules for ourselves. I mean, how many of y'all have ever, you know, drove by a hitchhiker? Amen? Listen, my dad said I, I should never pick up anybody I couldn't take. Look at me. 
I'm not going to pick up a lot of people. Amen. I'm not. But uh, there's been times and moments where I've listened to the Lord and God really did an amazing work in life where I had an opportunity to just shine for Christ, for somebody who desperately needed a little bit of light in their life. Jesus, when he was in a certain area, he came across a man who was born blind. He's never seen a sunset or sunrise. He was born blind. And the disciples asked him, Jesus, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus said, this man did not sin nor his parents. He was born so that the glory of God may be revealed in his life. And then Jesus said, we must work the works while it's still day because night is coming when no one can work. And so Jesus got this guy, and he's like, come here. And he, he took some mud, he spit in it, and, and he, he put the mud in the guy's eyes, and he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And so the guy did. He ran straight to that pool, washed, and his eyes were back. Now Jesus, he's healed blind people before. Throughout the Gospels, we see him touch one guy once. He touched uh, another guy twice, and he was healed of his blindness. And then this guy, Jesus made, like, mud and put on his eyes could you imagine, I heard an old pastor say this one time, if you got those three together in a room and got them to talk about what Jesus did, they would argue because their healing was the real healing. The one touch, the two touch, and the Muddites, that's, uh, they would form congregations right there. And they'd immediately begin to talk about whose healing was better. But Jesus healed everyone differently, and he still does. He gives us unique and beautiful stories. And so this guy who received healing... When the community heard, immediately they brought him before the Pharisees and asked him, how did he heal you? And he said, well, he made mud and put it in my eyes and I washed and, and his name is Jesus. Uh, that, that's all I know. And they said, well, he can't be of God because he healed you on the Sabbath. He made mud on the Sabbath. That's wrong. That was one of those rules that they made. They made rules on top of rules on top of rules. And it was a burdensome thing to the people. And so they even brought the guy's parents in just to really investigate this. And they said, was your son really born blind? He's like, yep. And well, how did he heal? And he, they said, ask him. He's of age. Because it says in the Gospel of John chapter 9 that they were afraid that they would be kicked out of their church if they said anything about Jesus. And so they brought the guy back in there with them. And they said, tell us the truth. How were you healed of your blindness? And he said, I've already told you guys that. Do you all want to be his disciples too? And oh, they got mad about that one. He said, no, we're disciples of Moses. This man is a sinner and a blasphemer. And, and this the guy who's been blind all of his life said this. He said, well, here's a curious thing. You don't know where he's from, but he healed my eyes. And listen, not everybody is going to know the Jesus that you know. But that doesn't mean you should not tell them about him. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't shine for him. Amen. And Jesus found this guy. And they had a conversation. And he revealed himself to him. And in the earshot of the Pharisees, he said this. That they, the Pharisees, are blind because they think they can see. But you can see. And I said all that to say this. And if you get anything, please get this. Matthew highlights the words of Isaiah about Jesus, the servant, that he will not break a bruised reed and he will not snuff out a waning candle. Have you ever seen a candle like that? It's not quite out but all is it doing is just smoking. So you have to understand that there will be times in your life where you're going to feel like that bruised reed. You're not broken, but you have the weight of this world, the weight of sin, and the weight of brokenness, the weight of conflict upon you. And you have to understand that he's still the God who will bear it, not with you, he will bear it for you. Because he said earlier, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Rest. Amen? But you might be like that smoldering wick. You're not on fire. You're just making a lot of smoke. 
Well, that's not going to bring a lot of light, amen? A lot of smoke and no light and no heat. And I want to let you know that whether it's from brokenness or hurt or you burned out, all it takes is a, a tiny spark and all it takes is this Holy Spirit just to breathe upon you. If you just receive his spirit, he will ignite you again. You see, you can't make your own fire with God. He doesn't want you to make your own fire. God wants to bring the fire. And his fire is way better than the fire that we can produce on our own. He wants to bring the light. He wants to bring the fire. He wants to bring the praise and the glory into your life. And so Christians, wherever you're at in life, whether you feel like the bruised reed or whether you feel like the candle that's almost out, he is still able to work in your life and bring the healing. I want to read Isaiah, part of Isaiah 52, then we'll, we'll close. It says this in Isaiah 42, verse 6. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind. Christians, there are some people in your life that they have a veil over their eyes and their hearts. He's still the Jesus who can remove the veil and shine the light. He also says to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, the prison from those, the prisoner from the dungeon and the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass. New things I declare to you. Sing to the Lord a new song, the praise from the end of the earth. God wishes to do something new in our lives. He does, very much so. He can still use, use a bruised reed. He can still use a, a smoldering wick. But I want you to consider what he could do with a reed that has been healed and repaired by his caring hands, because he's gentle, and a candle that is burning brightly. But there may be some of us still stuck in the dark. Amen. Uh, as I said earlier, I, I didn't like the, the dark very much. Um, I have two older brothers and a younger sister, and what we would do is we'd play extreme hide-and-seek. Any of you ever played extreme hide-and-seek? This is where my oldest brother would turn the breaker off in the house. This is when the parents would go off for date night. We would play extreme hide-and-seek. And, seek. and uh, so sometimes me and my sister, we'd just be sitting there minding our business, playing our games, or, you know, reading a book. <laughs> no, not really. Um, and all of a sudden, the lights would just go out. And we realized that it's now extreme hide-and-seek. <laughs> and the, the thing about it is we needed to hide because we did not want our brothers to find us. Amen. And uh, we, we would do that for an hour or two. We just running through the house in the dark. And we'd only been hurt a few times, amen, <laughs> right? But uh, that's kind of how some of us are living life with the breaker off, running through the house, playing hide and seek from God. And I promise you this, you can't hide from him. I tried. I tried real hard, but he, he's, he knows where you are. He asked Adam, where are you? He still asks us, where, where are you? Have you let him heal your bruised reed? Have you let him breathe upon the small ember of your wick? Because he still does the fire and the healing. Amen. Would you please stand as we go to the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, you still do new things. You still do wonders, and God, I, I was able to see quite a few wonders this week. And Father, I ask that you would do a work in our hearts this morning. Father, I know that there are, are some people here, and they have many questions. And some of them still might be skeptical of the Bible. But Lord, I, I just wish that they would come to this one resolve, that they have life. And you've given them a life. And so Father, I ask that they would search for the truth and the creator, the one who gave them this life, and Father, that would lead them to the light. 
Lord, that you would help them see with clear eyes what you have done. Father, we thank you for this time and this moment. We can worship you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all so much for coming out to worship with us this morning. I hope you have a beautiful rest of the day and a beautiful tomorrow. How many of y'all are off tomorrow? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, uh, I hope you all have a beautiful day with the Lord and your family tomorrow. Uh, please come back tonight if, if the Lord leads you at 7 and we'll do it again. Uh, and as, as before, um, we're going to have some men at each door. And if you'd like to give towards uh, helping out the Lofton family, uh, please give as the Lord has determined. Amen. But I love you all so much. Would you, uh, oh, wait a minute. I almost forgot one thing. We have a dear couple here, uh, Ben Ulmer and Melissa Cruz. They will be getting married this coming Saturday. Man, very, very cool. Amen. And, uh, and so they, they wanted to just invite the congregation. If you'd like to participate in their wedding, they'll be married right here at 3 o'clock Saturday. And they'll have a light social afterwards. So, uh, man, uh, ju and just uh, celebrate them. Make Ben feel embarrassed. Amen. Just walk up to him and, uh, you know, amen. So, but, uh, but we love you guys and um, I love you all so much. Would you pray with me one more time? Uh, Lord Jesus, I uh, thank you so much for the healing that you provide for us. God, I ask that you would continue to be with every heart, mind, and soul here, Lord, that we would go and be a bright, shining fire for you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name, all God's people say, amen. amen. Thank you all.